when we talk about growing up, it's usually a very personal conversation. And so I look back, for example, back to 1987 when I was a mere 17 years old on my first overseas trip. And I think, you know, I was pretty wet behind the ears back then. Uh, and I'd like to think I've grown up at least a little bit since then. Well, the interesting thing is that societies undergo that same kind of change and evolution. And since cities are the physical manifestation of society, that's where we can often see the most growth and change. And that's very important because we're in an era now, how about I just hold it, uh, <laughs> where we're undergoing a major transformation in how we live and experience cities. And I like to refer to this as America 6.0. <laughs> the next stage in our long maturation as a country. So in order to know where you're going though, you do have to know where you've been. And I'd like to do now is in about 120 seconds or so, give you a history of American cities and planning. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, it's nice to know that works. All right, <laughs> version one. Version one, we're like a newborn baby, newly arrived on this continent, and we're you know, trying to basically survive and establish ourselves, and we have these agrarian colonies and initial cities, and by the end of this, we kind of pull ourselves up on our two, own two feet and stand up and become a nation, and leads us into version 2.0. Version 2.0, we're like a gangly kid who's kind of spreading out all over the place. We enact the National Land Ordinance of 1785 that establishes how we'll settle the continent, but we're kind of a troublesome kid, and we're always getting into fights, and this, this period ends with a really nasty neighborhood brawl that nearly tears a family apart, and heads us into version 3.0, where we find a way to patch things up a little bit, and in version 3, all of a sudden, you know, we're that preteen, that kind of awkward preteen years, and we're experimenting and trying new things, and we, for the first time, we become a, become a major industrial society and create a lot of wealth and we urbanize very rapidly, but that leads us into version four. And in version four, all of a sudden, we're in our teenage years, but we're the good kid, the good teen, right? And so we decide to take some of that money we made in, in the previous version, and we clean ourselves up a little bit, and we start the two great city planning movements of that era, the City Beautiful Movement and the Garden City Movement. And both of those are intended to bring nature back into the city and clean up our act a little bit. But that ends tragically in another really <laughs> nasty neighborhood brawl. <laughs> And heads us into version five, our college years, where we throw out the good teenage years and we decide to throw a big party. And this is the great wave of suburbanization after World War II, where we just spend, 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 and pave over everything. And we're all about cars, 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 everything mass produced, clothing, food, you name it. And we go on this fantastic spending spree. But unfortunately, like all spending sprees, it has to come to an end. And it ended in about 2008 and led us to where we are today, which is America 6.0. So, what is America 6.0? What is defining it? Well, the main headline is a renewed interest in cities and city life. Now, in actuality, this started in about the late 1980s. And there are really two historical reasons that are important for why we're here, where we are today, and two cultural reasons going forward that I want to talk about. And this is important because this is more than just sort of a, a simple trend. It's not just cities versus suburbs or millennials versus boomers. There's something much deeper going on here. So in terms of why did we get here, there really were two groups of people that fought back against the prevailing wisdom in version five. One were all the preservationists and people who stayed in cities when everybody else was fleeing. And they fought very hard to essentially save us from ourselves and save our civilization. And they lost a lot of battles, but they won the war. And for them, we owe a great deal of thanks. In fact, they should have monuments erected to them because we have this civilization to enjoy, which most of which would have been destroyed. Secondly, we have the waves and waves of middle-class kids who, like me, were able to travel abroad and study abroad, really starting in the 60s and 70s, but picking up in earnest in the 80s and 90s. And like a previous generation had gone to war in Europe and saw the Autobahns in Germany and came back and said, we want those, and they came back and built them here in the US. This group of people went overseas and experienced the lifestyle that they had in those newly rebuilt cities in Europe and in Asia and said, we want that here. And they fought those battles to try to make that happen. I was reminded of this about a decade ago 
when I was talking with a developer in New Mexico, and he said to me, he said, this generation grows up traveling to Europe and comes back wanting to know why America sucks so much. <laughs> Chew on that for a little bit. So that's kind of how we got here. What about going forward? Well, a lot of this has to do with maturing and growing up. And there's a lot of things that we learn when we grow up. There's two qualities that I really want to focus on. The first one is actually a fairly boring quality, and that is money, right? Generally speaking, as we get older, we get a little bit better about managing our money. We learn the, the consequences of certain choices, and we understand how to manage it better. And that's important because going forward, we're going to have to do a very good job of it. The reality of it is after version five, we're basically broke. Not entirely broke, but the credit cards are basically maxed out. But that's okay because we're older and wiser now and we'll be able to deal with it and figure it out. The second thing that is more interesting to me but is a little fuzzier is the social nature of human beings. And one of the other great lessons of life and growing older is that we learn that life is a lot more than just collecting things or getting from point A to point B really quickly. That it's those experiences, those connections with other human beings that really matter. I mean, sure, we love our toys and our houses and our cars and our boats, but we also tend to learn with a little bit of time that those houses, they mostly sit empty. Those cars, they can become as much of a dead weight on us as the liberator they were supposed to be. Instead of going out and experiencing life, we may decide to stay home because we're worried about traffic and parking. And that's a shame because cities are meant to connect people with each other. The entire reason we form cities is to form human and social bonds. In fact, when you hear somebody mention the phrase sense of place, that's really what they're talking about, that there's an obvious presence of other human beings that you can see and hear and touch. And the tragedy of version five is that we kind of threw all that away. We discarded that as we grew and we forgot about it, and we essentially built commodities. We built subdivisions and shopping centers and office parks, which lack the humanity that we're looking for. And the, the problem with building commodities is that once you've used them up, they're very easy to just throw away. Ray Bradbury, the famous science fiction writer, he also wrote a lot about cities, and I think he said it really well. He said, in Paris, with miserable weather, in thousands of outdoor eating and drinking establishments. The generations gather to talk and stare because talking and staring is one of the great pastimes in the countries of the world. And if you think about it, why do 12 million people a year come to Savannah, Georgia? They come here because this is one of the great places in the country to walk, talk, and stare. It connects with our humanity. So the question then is, how are these going to influence us going forward? What kind of adult will we be? Well, some of us think, in fact, some very smart people think that we'll continue to be the starry-eyed dreamer, that the future is going to be all about you know, high tech and Buck Rogers and driverless cars, crazy buildings, drones, you name it. But I think we should be cautious in assuming that. That really is the dream of version five projected forward. And anything that requires a massive new infrastructure, forget it. We can't afford it, it won't happen. So if not that, then what? What kind of grown up will we be? Well, I think we'll actually be a multiple personality psychopath. <laughs> Some might say we already are. Well, here's a few of the personalities. Just to highlight a few, number one, we'll have the respectable professional, right? Our cities are going to start to look and feel a lot like our international cousins, and they're going to be much, much more about walking and biking and the social life that I mentioned. And in fact, the version five natural association we have with personal car ownership and worries about parking, those things are going to gradually disappear from our consciousness in version six. 
the wealthy and the upwardly mobile will be re-inhabiting all of our cities as they're already starting to do in many of the large cities. We'll also have the lost soul, the many, many cities, towns, and suburbs that either will refuse to adapt to the new circumstances or will not be able to. Many of these will wither up and just go away for lack of any kind of economy. And in fact, the cause celeb of the 21st century will be the suburban poor because having been pushed out of the cities, they will now inhabit those older suburbs in buildings that were not meant to last and in places where transportation is very poor. And we'll have a big debate about what to do about that. And we'll also have the free spirit. Parallel to our int renewed interest in socializing is a great interest in real food. And we're going to see a new wave of people re-inhabiting the countryside and willfully farming and creating higher value crops, more agricultural tourism, and the kinds of things that you see in other parts of the world. This, by the way, is the very famous wine country of Michigan. <laughs> so. so I have a little bit of homework for everybody. Don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it too. I mentioned before that cities are the physical manifestation of society. And what I think all this means is that society is reconnecting to its humanity again. We're learning how to see and feel and touch and engage all of our senses once more. And so what I would like everybody to do this weekend, since you don't have enough homework already, is go back to that Bradbury quote and find some place to sit and talk and stare. Get there by foot or by bike, which I know will be very difficult for many of you, but give it a try. Take something along that's very flavorful to eat and drink, and then just imagine what would it take for this experience to be so good that I would willingly do it all the time. And then be the grown-up, take responsibility, and make it happen. Thanks. Thanks.